Hello, dear old friend. You complete me. Hi, everyone. I'm going to take you on a stroll down memory lane. It's the early 2000s. You have an iPod the size of a brick in your pocket. Your computer can hold a whopping 300 gigs of data. Pop punk is still king. Life is good. You sit down to turn on your Xbox 360, which has yet to be consumed by the Red Ring of Death. You're booting up a soon-to-be classic sci-fi space opera shooter that's about the fall of humanity and will spawn an entire franchise. I'm sure for most of you, you're thinking about Halo. Of course, you know, with the dawn of Infinite on the horizon, that's got to be what we're talking about, right? So why don't you think here's a war when Marcus Phoenix is clearly the better character? Yeah, I guess today I felt like picking a fight, so you might as well get on with it. For many of us, we first learned about Gears of War way back in the early 2000s, when game trailers were either absolutely bonkers or just breathtaking teasers into new worlds we couldn't wait to explore. Such was the first Gears of War trailer. It felt like the start of something monumental. We met Marcus Phoenix as he walks through a war-torn city with not a moment to grieve the hundreds of losses before sprinting down a rain-soaked alley and gaining our first glimpse of a massive creature as we fade to darkness into that iconic logo. Chills. All underscored by the Gary Jules cover song of Mad World, which was featured in the very 2000s film Donnie Darko. A song that we can't play here because Metallica decided to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Napster and we all lost. But I digress. I don't know what your feelings are on Donnie Darko, that song remains, as the kids say, an utter banger. Gears of War was a game that really drove home the war is hell mentality, despite all of the outlandish sci-fi elements. At a glance, it seemed like just another action shooter series, big and possibly buff guys being all macho and shooting big macho guns at big scary creatures. Lots of guns, lots of explosions. I know I said big macho guns, but I cannot stress enough that this was driven home by the fact that they had chainsaws attached to those guns to really drive up the gore factor. But what made this game really special was how much that emphasized that the other gear soldiers in the coalition of ordered governments aren't just cannon fodder like they'd be in another game. This was a band of brothers. You like them. They're interesting, and your devastation when you lose them really drives home whose bodies are actually on the line when exploring the real and terrifying dark truths about war. This game wasn't short on emotional moments that made you give a damn about the survival of your fellow soldiers, and most of all, the very complex thundering badass you play as, Marcus Phoenix. Look at him! This man single-handedly made bandanas cool again after Brett Michaels made them the signature accessory of aunts with fading lower back tattoos trying to get backstage at a poison concert or dogs at brunch praying their owners either drop some eggs or let them stay home to chew their butts in peace. I'll even confess that the soul patch is still cool, but only if it's on Phoenix's face. Despite the addictive horde mode and phenomenal co-op that truly set the standard for co-ops, the franchise never held quite the same public esteem as Halo, especially as Halo found new footing in online play. Both games being an absolute blast, and whatever your preference may be, Master Chief may be what we think of when we think sci-fi space war shooter. But honestly, why? How is Master Chief such an iconic character? Cool helmet? All right, I'll give him that so maybe the Spartan edges out the bandana. But ask someone who loves Halo to describe Master Chief's best traits, stoic, mysterious, aloof, but somehow a little sassy at the same time. That's literally any cat. He's a cat that doesn't purr, I think. Do Spartans purr? Master Chief is like an empty Halloween costume for much of the franchise. Sure, he cares about saving humanity from the Alien Covenant, but it's largely from a place of professional duty. The fact that he's kind of just a grab bag of vaguely dickish, sarcastic one-liners is really obvious whenever he shares any scene with Cortana, who is a much more interesting and emotional character. The Chief exists as a neutral device to insert yourself into. There is nothing neutral about Marcus Phoenix. Let's do a little point-counterpoint. Okay, in Halo, we meet Master Chief when he's woken up from suspended animation. I mean, pretty much, he's an ice cube baby that people call on when they need someone to shoot a tall alien. In Gears, Marcus is in prison, the victim of an unjust system that hates him and will continue to hate him no matter how many times he saves their bacon over and over again. And whose bacon is Marcus saving? His friends! Yes, he actually has a literal best friend that isn't a glorified Tamagotchi.
I'm sorry, Cortana. It was a cheap shot, but someone had to say it. Marcus Phoenix has relationships and people he cares about on the battlefield. He holds grudges, he has a temper, and eventually he has a beard which we all know is the key to great character development. And Marcus has familial attachments and hang-ups. He goes full-blown daddy issues by Gears of War 3, and in Gears 4, he has a son himself. Over the course of the franchise, we see Marcus live life and grow. It feels like Master Chief is basically stuck back in the freezer between each Halo game. Sometimes, he disappears entirely. A big deal is made of Master Chief being the last Spartan. But when we got the game about the other legendary Spartans, Master Chief wasn't even there. At the end of Reach, when the Spartans sacrifice themselves to give humanity a chance, they hand off the baton to Master Chief like the original cast of Scrubs pawning Season 9 off on these a-holes. Yeah, I said it. Master Chief is the Dave Franco of video games. Swish. Halo 2 even introduced the Arbiter, which was an alien that was a better Master Chief than Master Chief. Now at this point, I can feel the ratio on this video going sideways, so you can all stop clicking the little thumbs down thingy. I'm not talking about the gameplay, or how good the multiplayer is, or if I really want an Xbox Series X Halo Infinite Special Edition console because it looks incredible. No, I'm talking about the character of Marcus Phoenix versus the character of Master Chief. And that all comes to how well realized they are on the inside. After just one game, you know exactly what Marcus's motivations are, and they remain consistent. He's also a huge subversion of the buff action guy character. Yes, he has his demons, and clearly has a past he'd rather not dig into, and he barks hilariously intense things during combat, but he's also allowed to be emotional. He doesn't walk away emotionless. He agonizes for the loss of Dom and shows softness for Anya, who he eventually gets together with in the third game. He is not weaker for being human and having human fragility or desire, or daddy issues. Marcus Phoenix is a well-realized character. And there's a reason why, after getting to know him over a few games, Marcus Phoenix feels like an old friend. The voice actor for Marcus Phoenix, John DiMaggio, has literally played all of your best friends. He was Bender on Futurama, Jake the Dog on Adventure Time, the Scotsman on Samurai Jack, and so much more. His voice has been on our screens for so long, it just makes the characters he brings to life feel automatically familiar to us in a comforting way. That voice also delivers quips and one-liners that really make his personality stand out. Uh, if we're selecting target, shouldn't someone with real military authority be here? It's Foz, right? <clears throat> yeah, yes sir. Shut the f*** up, Foz. Yeah. He's so dang cool. Oh, but I forgot. What about that one amazing Master Chief line? Okay, come on, there has to be some interesting character development for Master Chief. He wears a catheter all the time. Uh, he was a child soldier, but now he's a chief? That's kind of a success story. Someone, help me out here. I need another leader to make sense of this. Another chief. Perhaps a Hokage. So check it out. From chief to chief, we have to respect the legend that is Master Chief and that he has gone down in gaming history for a reason. Master Chief is a thousand pounds of warrior. It's not his fault, he's not a bucket of laughs. He was raised as a weapon. He was kidnapped from his family when he was only six years old, forced to endure life-threatening training until he was 14. And then he was physically and genetically augmented to become the perfect super soldier, so sorry if they forgot to inject personality into him, they had other preoccupations. Master Chief is the classic man with no name in the good, the bad, and the ugly, and uh, uh. Look, I'm gonna be honest, that's about it. I can't believe my own counterpoints because come on, Marcus Phoenix is obviously the better character. I mean, Master Chief is just a guy who puts on a helmet and smells his hot breath all day. And honestly, I, I couldn't tell you other than, and he talks to some random blue lady, I don't know. Blue men are cooler. A cool suit design and attitude doesn't make you a great character. It makes you Boba Fett. But even Boba Fett got cool character arts in The Mandalorian, so that's not even true. Basically, Master Chief sucks once again. I mean, another example that I can give is it takes skulls to play with him to make the game even fun. You gotta do all these multipliers and stuff like, come on, your base game should be fun. Marcus Phoenix is the GOAT. I mean, it was the first game that I could think of that actually embraced meme culture with Carmine dying, and he embraced it, so I'm gonna embrace it. And to be fair, you don't really play Halo for the character arts. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of lore and backstory, especially in the novels, but there's not a lot of heart. And since it's first person, that's an easier storytelling device to put you in the driver's seat. 
But when it comes to who you want next to you in a foxhole, oh, it's Marcus Phoenix all the way. I've made my case, but let's pivot for a moment and go into a deeper discussion about what makes this game and character resonate with so many of us. Okage, come on back. And Vanessa, our amazing producer. Hello, Vanessa. So, uh, when you all played Gears, I mean, did the characters resonate with you, or is everything I just babbled about just a, a crock? I think the characters definitely resonated with me, mainly because I think the games was all about brotherhood. Um, I mean, the game literally opens with you freeing your brother, um, and from there, you go through all these different trials and tribulations all throughout the trilogy that climax in three. So I think it definitely resonated with me because you saw them go through so much together, and I'm, we all have friends like that. At least I hope you have friends. <laughs> Vanessa? <laughs> Honestly, for a lot of the same reasons, I loved that entire team. I feel like a lot of, uh, especially a lot of like the war, or, like space shooty type games that I played of the time, the characters were basically just like badass vessels that like throw a grenade and they walk off and they feel nothing. And that's a lot of the characters in Gears, but there's so much backstory to them and so much specific little personality traits and things that they like that they ended up feeling like my friends too. And I even like picked up some of those things since I played it in such a formative time. Like later in life when like Dom is going through grief and he picks up gardening, I literally have the same coping mechanism now because of how much that made an impact on me and just how obsessed I was with Dominic Santiago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think Dom is actually super relatable, too, because all throughout the game, his his entire motive, I don't want to say his entire, but a lot of his motive was based off of his wife. Yes. Like, I think there's a lot of people in the world right now that are just, they got one thing and they're just holding on to it. Uh, so I could kind of relate to that because there's been a point in my life where it's like, yo, it's kind of hard to get out of bed, but... I got this one thing to look forward to to keep me fighting. I thought that was dope about Dom. Yes, and it, it, like it says so much about his character as well, uh, because you get like you get to learn that like he had this teenage pregnancy and it was this thing that like could have been a mess up for him, but instead he was like, no, I'm gonna step up to the plate and like be a good person for Maria and like you know have this kid with her and get a good job for her. And so like his motivation starts young, and it's so much him being like, this is the last mistake I'm ever gonna make like this. To tells you everything you need to know about the dude to where like all of his value systems are so consistent. Yeah, the, the thing that struck me about Gears, and this is true to Halo to an extent, but both of them are kind of war stories. But, you know, Gears feels like, especially it came out not that long after the, the very successful Band of Brothers series that was on HBO, but you can go back to older like war movies and stuff like that, that despite the fact that the stakes are so high, everything feels intimate. Whereas like if you look at a Halo like, it's big from the get-go and everything's big. Like, you know, the fate of the universe and, 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 and everything else like that. And I think it's allowing for those more intimate character details, I think, really helps flesh out a lot of these characters. Um, is, is, is there anything else that we haven't gone over with regards to, say, Marcus, uh, that you think um, helps further ground him as a character and, and, and make him less than the stereotype that I think, you know, only a, a casual look at the game might, might give you? Well, I think just the fact that he went through all three games without losing his do-rag keeps him very grounded. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was messing with you. <laughs> it's his personal item. He yeah. likes it. He's not letting go of it. You got to put some respect on that man's do-rag did not fly through, through all the worm. fight. Yeah, he he should have lost the General Ram fight. He stayed on. You got to respect it. Um, uh, I, I, actually, on that note, uh, General Rom, uh, many things. I think a lot of discussion come up for both Halo and Gears that sometimes they haven't been able to put forth um, en specific enemies that are strong enough. Whereas kind of the whole idea of the Swarm or the whole idea of the Flood and the Covenant, you know, obviously makes for a, a, a very strong enemy. How important are those enemies to creating these memorable characters? I think they're very important because it wasn't just about necessarily fighting the enemies, but they also created fear. You you generally feared generally General Ram, but also you feared going out at night, like the moments, I forgot what they were called, I think they were called the Krill, like the little bat creatures. Yep. Yeah, walking in certain sections, like it, it felt like you were in this world that really was on the edge versus something like Halo. It just kind of felt like a space opera, like it was just this big spectacle. I really felt like I was in the trenches with those characters. No, I wholeheartedly agree with you, especially when you brought up like General Ram specifically, like the introduction of his character and having him like immediately kill off very violently a character that you also grew attached to right at the start made the stakes feel higher. Because a lot of the times you have these like thundering badasses 
fighting these other thundering badasses and the stakes don't feel like anything. And Gears was always very smart where whenever it introduced a villain, whenever it introduced a character like that, it immediately showed you how devastating they were and also the weapons that you would have to like counter them with where it's like, you need big guns to take these things on. They, they eliminate everything in their sight. And so I always remember that introduction of Ram and stabbing, I wish I could remember the name of that character, through the stomach and and that like that that moment where you're just like oh it's about to go down. <laughs> yeah, it's it, 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 it's a really interesting point because uh, when I compare Halo and Gears and when I play them, I think I die a lot more in Halo, but I think I have less confidence that I'm going to survive when I'm playing Gears. It really does. I, I I really like what you said there, Corey. Like there's just this, that sense that the the next you know hundred meters could 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 bring out anything. And it, and it could be very, very upsetting. Um, when we're looking at really strong game characters, uh, you know, Mar- Marcus Phoenix or beyond, how much of it is sort of the story that the character finds themselves in versus kind of the characterization, the articulation of the character, you know, like their, their, their design? Um, I, think, I think it's about, for me, the story that they found themselves in. I think... I think actually Gears of War has one of my favorite pieces of DLC. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of DLC. I don't like to buy it. But the, I think his name was Jace, the one with the corn rolls. You guys remember when they came to the school uh, and they attacked? Just the way that DLC ended, like it showed what got him into the fight. He was a kid and he saw his hometown getting attacked. And then he slid into the trenches with the soldiers. And he was like, the soldiers were like, dude, you know how to use that? He's like, whatever, man, I'm here to help. I love that because it made it feel more like he was just a human trying to survive. The locusts came to fight. And he was like, you know what? I need to join this to better my community. I need to, it wasn't just some like, oh, I want to be in the military. Gun. It really felt like he was a person who had to do this for his people. Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. Um, because individually, I know every single character's reasons for why they go to war. I know Marcus's reasons. I know that Dom's going to war for his family. I know that the entire Carmine family isn't going to war for like the glory of war. <laughs> they just like a throw down fight. I know everybody's motivations. But when you take the combination of fleshing out characters and making them real people, and then you take this extraordinary situation that makes them all rise to the occasion and have to evolve, then you have lightning in a bottle. Because then you're like dying to see how these characters react to these different situations and you're you're going on that journey with them. I think it's very much like a delicate balance of both. Um, so we, we've, we've talked quite a bit about the, the differences between Master Chief and Marcus Phoenix. Um, is there any common thread between them other than their ability to hold two large guns? They both got big armor on one's a little bit more powerful than the other but, <laughs> uh, i don't know like i couldn't tell you much about master chief he's got much personality there <laughs> vanessa i say this loving marcus phoenix um neither of them has game marcus is lucky and he managed to score anya but both of them like it, it's very much like i don't really know how to in the middle of battle tell you that i like you type game although you know <laughs> Mar- Ma- Master Chief is romancing Siri uh, or Alexa, whatever your device may be. Anya is a real person, um, but but both of them are a, a little clunky, a little little struggling when it comes to spit and game. I-, I love that the universe is in peril in both titles, and she chooses to focus on whether or not they. Ha- I'm sorry, like the world's about to blow up, space is about to blow up. She's talking about oh, but he wasn't that charming. Like I mean, <laughs> I mean, in terms of like equal threads. <laughs> Because I'm like, uh, if they have anything in common, it's that their game is weak. Other than that, Marcus all the way. I mean, I, I, I would say with Master Chief that he might just wake up one morning and go, Alexa, what, what, what is game? Like, he's that much further removed from, from being able to have that conversation. Um, yeah. So final verdict. Uh, it sounds like we're in unanimity here. Uh, it, Marcus Phoenix versus Master Chief as a character, not as game. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I definitely feel that, that, that Phoenix is superior, more fleshed out. How, how about you two? Oh, for sure. I, I, I mean, his last name is Phoenix, so you already know he's more fly than Master Chief. Come on, man. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I, I completely understand why Master Chief is a nothing character for the same reasons why your character in the first Bioshock game is a nothing character, because in Ludo narrative storytelling, you want to make an empty shell hey, to Link slip yourself into. Link is a nothing into. character as well, and, that, and, and, and Miyamoto himself has, has acknowledged that. It's a link to the Exactly. Player. 
So. There's supposed to be something that you put yourself into so that you feel that story on firsthand. But the reason I love gaming is because it's another way for me to explore storytelling in a new continuation. And so the same reason that I love movies, I love characters that I can watch and follow a journey through is the reason why I'm going to fall for a character like Marcus Phoenix more because not only does he feel like the gruff badasses of the 70s and 80s and 90s things that I adore, uh, but he's someone who I want to see like several games through with. I want to watch his development. No, no. And and on the topic of characters, uh, I would like to thank you two characters for joining us in this discussion. Vanessa, Corey, uh, we definitely, definitely need to do this again sometime. So there you have it. Unanimous, probably not unanimous throughout the entire world, and you'll probably let us know in the comments below. And make sure that you subscribe so you can tell us what we did wrong in all of our future videos. In fact, you can do it for the past ones as well. If you want to learn about the reasons that Halo is great, then you should check out our secretish history of Halo Combat Evolved. Also, check out our great video that's about Bioshock and the biggest twist of all time in video games. That was done by my good friend, Gerard. Okay. There you have it. Until next time.